Thanks, thanks. I, I'm not totally sure what Uncommon Core means, uh, but this is kind of a general talk. Uh, it's, it will have some technical content, but it's, it's aimed for mostly a general audience. When I get a little technical, I will give you the overview of what I'm trying to say, so you won't feel too snowed about it. But I have some, some material that uh, somebody working in the field might find interesting as well. So when you do physics colloquia, you, you aim at a very broad audience because the physics itself has many subfields nowadays. And not everybody understands at the cutting edge what's going on in the other ones. So, uh, but this is a much more general uh, audio, uh, uh, talk intended to be. Okay, and um, so uh, I was glad to be asked to give a, a general talk like this uh, because uh, through my work in, in, in the Department of Energy, I was uh, working as uh, assistant secretary in charge of the Office of Science and Department of Energy, and that funds about 70 to 80 percent of, of physics research in the United States. But also it has biology, chemistry, material science, and many other things, computer science. And um, so I got some kind of uh, uh, view about uh, funding research in this country, and one of the challenges that, that's coming up for us for this next uh, century, well, the century that we just started, is our energy future. And I'll start out by telling you what I mean by that. Uh, many of you already know this, but I just have a very few view graphs to set the context. And um, this next generation of, of students has something in common in that all that came from uh, the revolution that took place. Well, that revolution isn't totally finished, it's continuing, but uh, we have a new one on our hands, and this is how to supply energy for our populations that we expect to um, be born and live in this 21st century, and uh, how science uh, uh, can help us, and the opportunities that young people have to participate in this, just like I had an opportunity to be involved with semiconductors and all that kind of stuff in my, my day. And uh, young people are very interested in doing something that has some exciting science, but also has some societal value or interest. So here, here is something. And, uh, and you will see other, other aspects of, uh, of the, the various disciplines float into this. Okay, that, that's what I'm trying to say today. So this is a kind of general talk about our energy future, and as I said, I'm going to start out with some general things, then uh, um, go and um, give you a very brief coverage of some of the uh, possible technologies that we uh, can see on the horizon that will help us solve our problem. I think what everybody in this room believes is that one way or another we're gonna solve this problem. Um, just because I think most people want to have their children and grandchildren to have at least the same lifestyle or um, opportunities that they had. And uh, we don't know exactly how this will, will occur because we don't know all the science and technology, neither the science nor the technology, to make it happen. But we feel somehow that this will happen, just like I felt when I started 50 years ago. Okay, so that, that's, uh, it's not a very scientific approach. But this has uh, uh, happened for many generations before. We've made revolutions and we expect something to happen in this one. So now, the background. So uh, what you see on this um, uh, view graph is the uh, population explosion on our planet. So we were going along from about 19, 1750 to 1950 with a slope that was more or less small. And now we have a slope that's all of a sudden much bigger. And uh, however, um, some planners, and I don't know how, how good their um, extrapolations are, is that we'll probably um, saturate at a population of about 10 billion people uh, in the 22nd century. 
we don't know what's going to be. But it, there's always a, a, some kind of feedback if, if the lifestyle isn't so good and people have smaller families and you know, we expect something maybe like that will happen. We don't know. <coughs> this view graph uh, shows uh, the world energy demands. Uh, I'll show you the United States down here. United States over uh, a period here, the 60 year period, uh, ex there's some extrapolation. We don't know how good this extrapolation is, but uh, the prediction is that, that the um, over a 60 year period, the energy demands will double. Well, that's not really uh, a, such a big increase when you consider that the world population, um, well, uh, let me go to world population, world population and, and energy demands here is going to go up by a factor of about four, and that's more like the population, but that uh, uh, has to take into account not only people, but increasing lifestyle of three quarters of the people on the planet. And right now, uh, we have the developed world, uh, that's one of these view uh, one of these slides, it's the third from the top, this one here. Uh, developing world is increasing rapidly and the, the um, uh, industrialized world, that, that's a smaller fraction of the total. That's maybe a third. And so you see that's going on one direction and then a much larger population. So it's a population times the expectation for each population that you have to take into account. And that's what's driving the numbers. So when you put it all together, you get a curve like this. It's an estimate that's, I, I don't know uh, how accurate, but um, plus or minus 25%, something like that. And what it what says, the, uh, some bottom line figures are shown in this little box. So uh, right now, um, we're a little bit uh, more advanced year. This is year 2000, we're 2008. So we're roughly uh, 15 terawatts of uh, a consumption, energy consumption on the planet right now. And by mid-century, the expectation is that this will double approximately. That's probably a pretty good expectation. And, uh, and by end of the century, it'll triple. So, okay, those are rough numbers. Uh, population is going to increase by more than that. And uh, we have all these people that were generally have nots uh, this is the developing world that are going to have much more energy than we have. The U.S. is uh, uh, roughly a quarter of the world's energy and 5% of the population. So that's going to change dramatically, relatively speaking. So we're going to get more efficient and we're going to do a lot of things. And we don't know exactly how we're going to do it. And it's, uh, at, I'll give you some of my views about part of this as we go along in this talk. Okay, so right now, 85% of uh, the energy comes from fossil fuels. We don't expect that to be the case uh, by mid-century. We'll have a large increase, but we're also changing the mix of energy sources. So we have kind of a big revolution. And this means that there are a lot of people uh, on the planet that have to be involved in the science, technology, and all the business and everything else. Okay, another uh, aspect of this is um, environmental issues. Many people think that the environmental issues will get us before the supply. Uh, I don't know what the price at, at the gas pump is before people will, will be influenced that we have a problem on our hands. Four dollars certainly, uh, that's what we're paying now more or less, uh, is, is, is way too low. It's not changing people's habits very much. If it's $10, maybe it will have some, some impact. There'll be some, some place, we don't know exactly where it is, some place where people will decide public transportation, telecommunication rather than travel. They'll ch people will do different things. They'll change their lifestyle. We don't know what, when that's going to happen. Okay, so let's look at these environmental things. Uh, this, this figure over here is a thousand year figure. It goes, from, goes back 1,000 years. And you could see that uh, there's an increase in CO2 
that's quite interesting from a level of about 290 uh, parts per million by volume to uh, a level that in the year 2004 was 380. Uh, we expect that to probably get up to about 500. And when you look at this uh, figure over here, which goes back uh, 400,000 years or so, uh, we see that there are cycles. These cycles um, uh, span a 10 degree uh, uh, temperature fluctuation. So we've had cold periods and hot periods. Right, right now, at a hot period, you see we're right at the, at the tip of the historical level of the planet temperature close to it. And the level that we have of CO2 is somewhat higher than any that we uh, have recorded uh, in ice cores in, that, we, that you can find up in glaciers and places like that. So this is, um, that's the level of the scientific information, but it goes back for a long time because these glaciers have been around and they can dig into them and figure out uh, what the age of these uh, deposits are. So um, the temperature is a slight problem, but the temperature that we're thinking about is maybe one or two degrees, maybe not so serious on a 50 year time scale the CO2 development is much more serious and can go much higher than the values 500, which is well above uh, any level that we have any experience with. And we don't really know what the response of the planet will be when we get to these very high levels. <coughs> so where is the energy going to come from? That's this picture. It's a little bit of an old picture. I don't have a very new one. But it, it goes into the present century, so starting in the year 2000, going up um, uh, for 100 years. And the question is, where is this energy going to come from? And um, we don't know for sure, but here are some of the alternatives. Fossil will continue up, up to a certain level. Um, nuclear probably will increase by a factor of two worldwide. And I don't know what it will be in the United States, but worldwide it will. They're, they're, that, those are kind of the predictions. And then we have this big box here, which is renewables. And that is certainly going to increase. And there are a lot of different options. Uh, solar has sufficient energy to do everything for us. The big problem is how we're going to figure out a way to, to do it competitively, uh, economically, and uh, um, we can have a smooth transition from what we're doing now to having uh, that particular source. Right now, we're not ready to supply solar as a substitute. It's out there, but we don't know how to give it to you. So that's um, research for students and, and faculty at the University of Chicago. Um, wind is something that's uh, ready to go now. It probably can be increased by a factor of two with very little change in the cost structure. Much beyond that in the US is probably not so realistic. But for the whole world, maybe it can increase by a factor of three or four from where we are now. So we can um, uh, have a reasonable amount. Um, a country like Denmark, they're planning on 25% wind energy by 2025 or so. And um, then we have countries that, uh, Norway, that are entirely hydroelectric right now, totally. They do everything with that. And they have plenty of oil, too, so they export that and, and, and hang on to it for when it will be much more valuable. Uh, that's their strategy. And um, then we have uh, ocean tides, and that's not yet important uh, commercially. We have biomass that we're working on. Brazil's doing very well in biomass. I'll get, show you some view graph on that later. And the Iceland is, is running on geothermal energy. So different countries have different options, and they're doing well. And what, what is also happening is these countries that are good in some particular technology, they're exporting their tech, not only products, but the technology to other parts of the world that can do it also, but they don't know how. So uh, this is economic opportunity for these countries. So we have uh, the, the Middle East, uh, their oil exported. We know them as energy countries. We're going to have new energy countries. Iceland might be an energy country. 
in the geothermal area, and Norway might be a co country in hydroelectrics, et cetera. We'll have new new concept about rich countries that are raking in lots of revenue. Okay, um, <laughs> to give you an idea, um, if you haven't heard this before, the idea is really a lot. You have to think about scale, and this is the s most scary thing about energy. So um, we're, sa we're saying that we'll need something like 15 more terawatts uh, by mid-century. That's not very far away. That's 40, couple e 40 and some. So that's grandchildren for you guys, even before. Okay? So um, uh, for 10 terawatts, we would have worldwide to do one new power plant at one gigawatt. So that's a large power plant. We'd have to do uh, one of those every day in somewhere in the world. This is a very large undertaking. We don't build anything like that nowadays. But that's to make this all happen. This is what is required. So no single solution. Certainly in the US, we're going to have a diversity of solutions because our energy demands are so huge. And we have the, we're ahead on, not ahead, but we're competitive in a number of technologies, competitive enough that it's not likely that we'll have just one solution. We'll have a number of solutions. And um, each country will have different solutions. And I'll go into that. So this uh, view graph uh, gives you an idea of where we are today. And that's the left. And on the right-hand side, uh, what we might be by mid-century. Uh, we'll have uh, oil, coal, and gas. The fossil fuels will still be there. They'll be very expensive, and we'll use them sparingly. Uh, and the renewables will take the place, so we have a lot of renewables. And so uh, solar, wind, geothermal. And we have between now and then, it has to be commercialized, expanded, uh, many-fold, and this isn't going to happen if we're, we have the technology only ready in 2040 because it takes a long time to commercialize all of this. So we have to get going very soon. And um, I'll give you some views at the end that it has to be a cooperative activity between the science world, technology world, government, local people, and the, uh, the voters, the taxpayers, and all of you. It depends on on what you want. So, well, this gentleman here has uh, <coughs> started us uh, at least on some course, uh, and he got me going on this back in 2003 with the State of the Union message where he said he was investing in hydrogen. This came as a big shock to many people, including me. <laughs> and, uh, and I got a phone call about February that said that, that we really need you to head up this hydrogen study because um, we have the potential of having money, uh, but does this make sense? There's been all of these studies that said that hydrogen was an unlikely uh, alternative for energy, our energy future, but this is the one that's offered. So uh, should we go in this direction or doesn't it make sense? So that was kind of our, our task and what should we do and how should we do it? So we came out a, with a report that said basically that this isn't crazy but very difficult. And um, the second thing it said uh, is that many of the technologies that would have to be developed to make a hydrogen economy would also work for many of the other technologies in uh, a constructive way. So we should go ahead with doing something with a, a mind that it won't be only hydrogen. Well, we haven't gotten funding for all these other technologies, and we still get some money for hydrogen, uh, uh, and we have to move faster and everything. But the president came back in 2006 and said more of the same, that he, he's keeping an interest and wants to put more money in energy, and that was really good. And then um, and recently, March 2008, he gave another major speech <coughs> that said that he was actually putting, well, this is next year's budget. He's not there anymore, so it's easy to talk. And uh, so he said he's putting money to help the whole world develop their energy resources, especially the developing world. So um, 
we have some commitment from the U.S., but it's not very clearly defined. Um, at the conference at which he made this major policy statement was um, YREC, YREC 2008. YREC means Washington International Renewable Energy Conference. That's the meaning of it. Many of you probably missed it when the report was in the newspaper. But for the energy world, it was kind of an important conference for the following reason. Uh, uh, when you plan for a conference, you plan for a certain number of people. They planned for 2,000 people, and the attendance was 8,600. Let's look at who came to this conference. People from 113 countries and 103 ministers. I think they were kind of bowled over by the number of ministers that came. And uh, with the number of ministers being this high, right at the conference, they pledged what they would do. And I'll show you some of the pledges then that they made. Um, one of, I was there uh, asked to be the rapporteur for the US uh, to summarize the art research and development uh, panels. There were several panels. And I attended them, and I made a presentation at the end of the conference of what was said and, and decided. Uh, and we're writing this up for an article. We'll post it on, on the University of Chicago website as soon as we get it done for you. Um, there was a big sense of optimism from all the countries that some, somehow we're going to solve this problem. And the most optimistic were the uh, least developed countries countries in Africa, uh, countries that uh, had very, very low standard of living. They look upon this just like the cell phone that provided a bootstrap for many people around the world. And this is going to be a bootstrap for energy resources for them. So they're very excited about this. Maybe you're surprised. but uh, And a good part of the conference was devoted to these, the interests of the developing world and how we were going to take care of them. In several countries, the United States, led the, the charge on that one. But European countries came up also with pledges. Uh, Germany, France came up with uh, substantial pledges uh, to match the US. So that uh, is interesting for you. And um, so the, the last thing says that the people that came, the ministers, were different than the ministers that I expected. We had one US minister, Harnish, who, uh, from the State Department, who knew something about science and, and the US program. He was a knowledgeable person, but we only had one, and this is our country. And, uh, and we had some fellows from the State Department. Uh, you know, there's people like University of Chicago alumni and, and faculty uh, who spend a year in Washington as fellows. There's a program like that. Anybody interested, you can apply. This is a good time to do that. <coughs> well, the delegates, uh, that the people that came, uh, seem to understand the scale of the energy problem. They seem to understand that it was a global issue. And the amazing thing was the degree of networking and collaboration that took place in the hallways. Now, I, I'm not a minister, and I don't understand exactly what's going on, but I just saw all these uh, enclaves of people uh, talking. And, and then at the end, there were, there were pledges. So something happened because uh, there was an output. <coughs> Here's some of the outputs. So I go, go through a couple of these. Uh, New Zealand uh, pledging 90% uh, renewable energy by 2025. You know, some of these countries have hydropower or, or wind. So they, can, they have uh, uh, good vistas. 30% um, uh, for Denmark total consumption. Um, uh, look, look at another one, uh, Germany. That's a big country, 18% by 2020 total consumption. And then I have on the next one a couple, a couple more with total consumption, Netherlands and France, 20% by 2020. We're not close to that in the US, not close. But it's good that we have all these other countries, because hopefully that will wake it up people that uh, we better do something. OK. 
Well, I think maybe I have Brazil in here. Maybe I want to show Brazil. Brazil is a good one because they have 80% for electrification, and that's based on ethanol. They have a biofuel. Uh, uh, what they find is that they can grow in their country because of the climate, they can grow sugar cane in bad land that they can't use for anything else. So their idea, and they're doing very well because you drive into a gas station in Brazil, you can, you, you can buy ethanol or gasoline and anything in between. And uh, their cars that they produce in that country will run on those mixtures. So um, something for us to think about, too. <coughs> OK, now I'm going to go through um, uh, some uh, technology, solar energy. And so the sun has a lot of uh, sunlight. Let me uh, show the top of this view graph. Um, we need uh, uh, something on the order of 50 terawatts. That, that would be by 2100. OK? So um, the sun uh, produces on the land, on the, on the planet, 36,000. So we have more than 1,000 times what we need. So uh, there's plenty of energy coming down. Uh, we just have to have a, a fraction of 1% efficiency if we're going to use all the land, which, of course, we're not going to do. But uh, this is a doable problem, except the time scale is, tells us that we better start making a lot faster progress than we have been making in the, in the past decades. Um, and some of the other numbers here, I maybe look at the total human production of energy, uh, that is, with you, what you eat and your locomotion, add all of that together, one hour of sunlight. It gives you a scale of what humans do and what the sun does, OK? So uh, we always have to think about scale when we think about energy. OK, with solar energy, that's the most important source because it's the only one that has the volume that's huge and would solve all our problems if we had the technology available today. We have a lot of technology available at the laboratory scale, but we can't afford to use it. And we, we don't know how to expand it to scale up to meet uh, uh, the demands of 10 billion people. But we know a lot of things already that tell us that this, this is not an impossibility. But we don't know how to do it practically at the, at the present time. So with the solar energy, uh, this is what we're producing here in the world. So it's 0.002%, tiny, nothing. And uh, uh, ter terawatts. And um, the expectation is that we need roughly 15 terawatts to come from somewhere. And uh, so for the uh, electric demands, uh, 1.5 by mid century. That, that's an expectation. Well, you can see how many rooftops that we have to. This is a huge, huge, huge expansion that we need. Solar fuel, OK? Right now, we produce, um, uh, in a renewable sense, 0.2 terawatts over the whole world in a sustainable fashion. And so we would need our present um, amount, which is roughly 12 or so, because we use a lot for fuel. That's a big uh, demand. And then we'd have to double that, because we have to double by mid-century. So we're thinking about a huge amount uh, of um, solar fuel. Um, biomass is what we're doing right now because people think that they can do that quickly. And they can demonstrate that they can make ethanol from corn, but to make it on a basis that you get more energy than what you put in, that hasn't been demonstrated yet. And it hasn't been demonstrated what the financial aspect of it. But the farmers are happy because they're producing a lot of corn. And we'll find out pretty soon in the next few years uh, uh, the degree to which this can solve our problems. But we have other uh, uh, alternatives that I'm going to show you in the next few graphs, in the biofuels area, but other fuels as well. Um, the solar thermal, so, the solar thermal the world has been doing quite a bit of in, in heating <laughs> uh, water and space uh, with the sun. And, and mostly in, in developing world this is. <laughs> and right now, uh, we're doing uh, 0.006 
terawatts. It doesn't sound like so much, but it's the most that we have of anything, the moment, except for the um, uh, solar fuels. <coughs> and we have to increase that to two, roughly two terawatts. So we have big challenges ahead, great things for students, faculty, and we hope that there'll be some federal funding to help some of this go along. Now for me, I get roped into this in part because of this uh, reason here, that I work with nano things. That's one of my research fields, main research fields. And uh, so this um, uh, view graph explains why nanomaterials are important. Right now, without nanomaterials, we just don't know how to make the technological jump from where we are to where we have to be. Um, nanomaterials provide advanced materials. They advise, they provide ways that we can overcome some of the uh, obstacles that we have right now in reaching these goals. And, the, and what the idea is that nanomaterials have properties that macro materials don't have. And those properties turn out, many of them turn out to be desirable for this energy conversion. So if we can figure out how to do this and do this at a reasonable cost, we might be in business. Catalysis is one of these. Catalysis is one that appeals to me a lot, even though I don't work in that particular field, because it has an exponential dependence on the energy. And I'll explain that in a moment, how we have to think about this problem. This is something that I learned when I was a student here. You have to, when you solve a problem, when you try to scope something out, you have to develop an attitude of what's important. What do you have to put your emphasis on? And I hope when you leave today, you'll have some idea, at least what I think about it. And I think there are other people that agree with me with some of the aspects. Okay, and the third thing is the nanomaterials allow you to control the properties, two properties of material independently, whereas for bulk materials, you can't cannot control them independently. And the reason the physics behind it has to do that size is a parameter. And we can measure things as a function or control things as a function of size. And that gives us an extra handle that can be utilized. Okay, so that, that's, those are some of the ideas behind what's going on. Uh, the Department of Energy has, in the last year or so, come out with 10 books that are kind of primers that you could sit down and read. And uh, if you have any degree from the University of Chicago, you can make quite a bit of progress with them. You won't understand everything because some of it gets technical, but you'll understand a lot of it. And you'd have some idea how important this might be in your life. And if you have children or grandchildren or, or you're a student yourself, you can see if this is for you. The one on solar energy is a particularly good one, I think. <laughs> and what this says is the solar energy, what I, I said, the amount right now is, uh, that we're utilizing is pitifully small, and we have to accelerate our uh, research. Okay, this is a kind of a busy slide, and uh, let me tell you uh, a couple of points that's important. So this is new concepts for photovoltaics. So this is a conversion of solar energy into electricity. Uh, there is a, a theorem that, that that's very old, comes, goes about 50 years old, and it's called the Quasar-Shockley theorem. And it says that we can, with a single junction, uh, it's possible to reach a limit of an efficiency of 32% per junction. Guess what? We have reached that. That has been demonstrated in the laboratory. We can't, can't afford to do this for everybody because making a device like that right now is quite expensive. But if we were making billions of them, like we do for semiconductor electronics, maybe it wouldn't be so impossible or something like this. So at least we have the know-how in the laboratory. The goal is in the very near future to be able to do 50% efficiency. And that would be done with multiple junctions. So a junction, a single junction would be something like this. You have one semiconductor, a photon comes in, that means light comes in, it creates an electron hole pair, so it takes an electron in the conduction, in the valence band here, excites it up to a, an empty available state. You don't have to worry, I'm not going to be very technical. I just have a few things uh, here. And uh, then uh, 
the uh, say the electron goes uh, one elect one direction and the electron gets captured and then the uh, the hole goes in the other direction, you have electricity. So that's what the, the concept is. And we use that in photovoltaics on people's roofs. And so if you have multiple uh, uh, junctions, mean you don't use just one um, uh, semiconductor, but you have a stack of them. So this is semiconductor A, semiconductors B, C, and they have different band gaps. So some, one will capture blue light, one will capture green light, et cetera. And with this, it has already been demonstrated that you can get over 40%. This is in the laboratory. So we know that this will work. It will go beyond the Quasar limit because we have new physics. Nobody, this is very recent, the last couple of years was, was done. And then we have other ideas. Uh, so we have uh, like multiple, um, uh, for one photon coming in, you, you generate many electron hole pairs, and that has been demonstrated also the past few years. But nobody has been able to yet bring this into a device to make it work for a photovoltaics. But there are a lot of people working on this because this is a big, big advance in science. But the technology hasn't yet been achieved. And there are more things on this view graph, but I won't, don't have time to do everything. I want to finish my talk on time, more or less on time. <laughs> okay, solar energy and biofuels. Uh, um, we moved in this direction fast because uh, worldwide we know we can make some kind of fuels. We can make ethanol from uh, sugar cane. That's been demonstrated. A lot of that's been, been made in Brazil. They have a big industry. So this is switchgrass. This is one of the products that they're thinking. We, don't, we can't grow, grow corn, uh, we can't grow sugar cane in large quantities in the U.S. We don't have the right climate. So they have other things instead of that. Um, and corn is one of them, switchgrass is another one, and other cellulosic materials. The cellulosic materials have more promise for having more energy output than the corn. But time will tell what we're going to do because now we have farmers that are committed to one thing. We don't have to change what they're doing to have something else, but that's what we're doing. Another total, diff, totally different approach is to say that we're doing molecular biology and we're gonna change the whole system of how plants work and we're gonna change the plants themselves because we know basically that uh, we have CO2 out there in the atmosphere, and plant X will take CO2 and water and will grow. So if we can find some kind of new way to harness this much more efficiently than any plant we have around right now, or maybe it doesn't have to be a plant, algae and microbes are other alternatives that seem a lot more promising because the land mass that would be needed to fuel, get fuel for the whole world is very, very much less. But the technology is much further behind. So we'll see a whole staged uh, development um, of le least, uh, uh, less advanced technologies coming in sooner that are, uh, will have less lower efficiencies. But we have to go down this line so that uh, mid-century we have enough fuel. So, okay. So, this gives you an idea. And there are people at the University of Chicago. You have some really good people at, at, in this university that are doing uh, the molecular biology side. So we hope, we wish them great success. And so these are the plants, and it shows some of the chemicals that we're thinking about. And so this artif artificial photosynthesis maybe will make um, hydrogen, maybe methane. A lot of different possibilities depending on what you do and how you treat it. And different groups in, uh, around the world and different countries are trying different things. Uh, there's also the idea of just doing a, a fissure tropes rea reaction for people who are chemists in this uh, audience and uh, doing direct conversion of CO2 plus water to get a fuel. And uh, there's some small work in the U.S. There's some work that's going on in other countries. And some of it is, is advanced enough that they have some demo plants. So this is far away, you know, maybe 30, 50 years, 
to have this on a scale. But if we could have something like that, and then we treat the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere not as a bad thing, but as a fuel, potential source of a fuel. That solves our CO2 problem at the same time. So uh, if we could do something like that by the end of the century, that wouldn't be so bad. In the meantime, we get other modes. So we could keep our, our young people and uh, professors and all these folks working on energy, interesting energy-related problems in different phases, some that are far out and very difficult and some that uh, maybe are easier and we can have success. <coughs> One area that I work in is thermal electricity. And we've had some recent success. Um, uh, this field was kind of dead for, um, from the 1960 to 1990. And I had some guys from the um, uh, Navy come to visit me and ask me if I could help them solve some real, real problems because they wanted to make a submarine that was quiet. And thermoelectrics obviously would be quiet. And they wanted to know if there was any possibility to um, uh, significantly improve the efficiency of thermoelectrics because as they are, you couldn't run a submarine with thermoelectrics. And we had an idea in our group uh, to uh, use nanostructures and um, made that suggestion and uh, spent pretty much of the first decade after that proving in two dimensions, one dimension, then zero dimensions that every time you get to smaller dimensions, so you have more nano, smaller size, uh, the efficiency goes up. We had to understand these processes in the scientific sense. And now we're actually making some devices. I'll, I'll just show you that they're real devices. <coughs> it just came out in Science Magazine about a month ago. So ordinary professors, I don't really work on this so much. But I, this is one of my side projects. And if everybody had, can have a couple of side projects, it wouldn't be so bad people that have you know, some general knowledge. So uh, before 1990, we were at ZT. That's the thermoelectric um, uh, figure of merit. Uh, for about 30 years, we were at ZT at one. That was the total cap. And the last, uh, since 1990, we've entered all of this space. That means that we have improved by a factor of two. We really have to improve by about a factor of two and a half. And then we'd be in business. So we're close. And that's very encouraging. So what this would do would be a method of, of taking waste heat and making electricity out of it in, in simple terms. So, <coughs> so this is what our system is. We take nanoparticles. We have to make them in a certain way so that they scatter vibrations much more effectively than electrons. So that's where the science comes in. We figured out how to do this, and we have to compact that in a way so it, it's um, um, ideal density, theoretical density. And we figured out how to do that as well. And there are, so these are kind of the results to show you that uh, people make progress if they work at it. So this is the figure of merit, and this is the old stuff, and this is the new stuff. So 40% increase. Uh, and we kind of did this in about a three-year period. So uh, that's, we can have a number of successes in all of these different technologies. It wouldn't be so bad. In 10 years, we might look quite different from, from what, where we are now. This is a little more science. This is a device so that wor really works in the laboratory. And, uh, but it can be commercialized because it, it can be easily scaled up with the technology that we have. And so the idea is to apply it to transportation and maybe houses and other things. I'm going to go over now about five minutes or so on strategies and five minutes on thinking big, how we have to think about this whole problem and then wrap this up at the time I'm supposed to. I'm told I was supposed to finish at 5.15. So. Is that right? As, well, then I had question and answers. OK, that was, that was the idea, isn't that? <laughs> OK, so let, let me, a little bit about strategies. <coughs> so here's one strategy. 
uh, um, one photon comes in and you make many electron hole pairs. That has now been demonstrated. But now we have to have a research uh, project to actually utilize. Nobody is close yet. But moving, good papers coming out in research journals, but not close to solution. <coughs> Combinatorial, this is something that's taken over from the drug industry, so we can make, make many, many samples with different compositions to see what's the right. There's too many variables in making these uh, various different technologies, whether it's uh, for solar cells or it's for thermoelectrics or whatever, hydrogen materials. And so combinatorial screening is an important uh, technique. Here's catalysis. What's, what's great about catalysis is that materials at the nanoscale behave very, very differently in the, as they, in, they do in the ma macro scale. For example, a tiny gold particle that's a couple of nanometers in size, not very many atoms, is highly reactive, whereas a particle that's like 20 nanometers or so is not an effective catalyst. That's very good for us because what it means is we don't have to use a lot of material. And we can get real close to the particle and get um, a strong interaction, uh, molecular interaction. Uh, as you can see, the effect is um, uh, losing your reaction in one hour to having just a constant. And the reason why uh, the catalysis works so well is it has this exponential dependence on energy barriers. And that's what we do when we have a catalyst. Catalyst is introduced to change the value of the energy barrier, which we can control. And with nanostructures, you control this much more easily. So that's a good approach. Here's another good approach. Platinum is a great material for a catalysis. What this guy, Macrococcus, he's very close to here, is in the University of Wisconsin. And he made a calculation about three or four years ago that showed that if you uh, have um, just a few atomic layers of platinum and you introduce one layer of uh, nickel in between, or it could be some other transition metal as well for different reactions, then the top layer, which is the most active of platinum, will change its characteristic. It's still platinum, but it will change its characteristics totally with respect to chemical reactions. And it has to do with charge exchange between these layers. So, uh, so this was a, th a theoretical paper. And um, experiment came a couple of years later. And so this is year 2007. Here's one example of his theory. So we have this platinum layer on the surface. And the next layer uh, is 50% uh, uh, platinum nickel. And uh, we have a factor of 10 increase of reaction rate of some particular reaction. There are other cases and different catalysts. But what I'm talking about here is something with a dramatic difference, a 10 percent change, a 10 factor of 10 change in reaction rate is something that we could util utilize in some kind of process. And we can make this large scale, make it robust. It's very interesting. Uh, here's an example of um, molecular biology. Of, uh, so algae, uh, uh, there are algae in this world that will make hydrogen. Hydrogen is a nice fuel, right? You burn it and you get water, that's all. So it's very attractive. However, uh, at the same time when it uh, decomposes uh, water to make hydrogen, it also makes oxygen. The oxygen fouls the reaction. So you can see this exponential drop in the reaction rate. However, if the, you change the catalyst, and this is molecular biology here, you can greatly change the reaction rate. This is an exponential scale. So this is a very big difference. So well, this gives you an idea that we can play around with catalysts. We can play around with biological systems and uh, change the reaction rates by a lot. Uh, here's another example that we've used in our lab, made use of. And this is nanostructures. This is for hydrogen application. And uh, so what you see 
is that if you have a polycrystalline material, you can increase the uh, r rate of release of, of hydrogen by fa an order of magnitude when you make it into a nanosystem. And the picture of what's going on is you increase the diffusion rate greatly for a very small particle, and you can get the hydrogens everywhere in, in, in quick order. You could, at the same time that you improve the kinetics in this dramatic way, you also reduce the uh, rate, the temperature at which the uh, release takes place, which is also desirable because that's a way of, of reducing the, um, the bonding between the um, hydrogen. The problem is that the hydrogen is too heavily bonded to the um, hydride that holds it. And um, we don't have in nature exactly the right material to store hydrogen, so we have to make some kind of ersatz material. And so nano is very helpful for that, and this is one illustration. And we have been using this. Hit, designing materials with theory uh, is, is something that's used a lot now. Instead of uh, trying uh, a thousand different materials, you make some calculations, which is quicker and a lot cheaper, and it gives you some guidance of some good approaches that have a higher potential for being successful. Um, think big and go small. And so let me go just tell you about that. The electronics industry, this is where, where I've been for a long time, and um, we have something that's called Moore's Law. And what that tells us is that in as we go linearly in time, so this starts, well, any, any time is good, year 2000, and we go up in, in, in time. The uh, size of um, electronics devices, uh, they uh, decrease in this uh, exponential fashion, so this is log scale. So 100, 10, 1, okay? <laughs> the size of devices gets smaller. Their um, efficiency goes up also by the same factor, and the cost goes down by the same factor. Everything has an exponential dependence, and this is called Moore's Law. It's not a real law, but it's something that the electronics industry has been guided by, and they try to make this law because if they make the law, they're in business, and if they don't make the law, somebody else uh, who is, has made the law uh, takes over their business. They can't compete, they go broke. So uh, this has been the roadmap that has guided the electronics industry for the past 40 years or so. And it's still going. And it's amazing. We thought that by now it can't go because we're going to smaller and smaller dimensions where the gate sizes are now three atoms. And <laughs> how much smaller can we get? But this thing is still going. OK. <coughs> what we need is Moore's Law for new uh, industries. Energy needs a Moore's Law. We have very few examples. I could only think of two, but we need a lot of examples because if we had some kind of way to institute Moore's Law, some of these laboratory level um, technologies that we write, know today can be scaled up and could be the same thing. When I started, when I got my PhD in 1958, when you looked at a transistor, it was just a bunch of junk. And uh, uh, at that time, it wasn't very clear. Uh, well, at least when I was a graduate student, it looked like a bunch of junk. And it didn't seem so clear that this was going to be a device that would change the world. But uh, then we had Bell Labs, and we had Siemens, and a few other companies like this. And they got busy and took what uh, they went and marched. And, they made the revolution. We need something like this taking place uh, for uh, energy. Here's one example where um, uh, we do have a Moore's Law, and this is in lighting. Well, the Moore's Law applies to the efficiency. So this is lumens per watt. Lumens is how much uh, um, uh, light that, that comes out, and the watts is how much uh, electrical energy goes in to produce the light. And you could see that the efficiency of these devices is going up on exponential scale with time. So the light emitting diode was discovered in the laboratory in the, after my PhD in the 1960s, close by here, actually, Holignac and University of Illinois, 
was a big player in this. And so uh, now we have uh, white light and green blue and everything that happened since 1990, big revolution. And now, the, um, uh, in, at least in the laboratory, uh, you can make light emitting diodes that are better than fluorescent lamps on this exponential scale. But what we can't do yet is make it cost effective. So that part of Moore's law is not yet here, but people are working at, at it, mostly in other countries. But it will happen soon. So uh, this is a big thing because 22% of electricity uh, currently used in the US uh, goes into lighting. So this would be a, a 6% item in total energy budget for the US. So this is not something to sneeze at. And this is going to happen within the next 10 years. I, I think almost everybody believes that. And uh, the items that we have to work on for research is shown here, new materials, controlling defects, carrier density, um, the quality of the light, and, and cutting down the cost. Another example of Moore's law that we do have now is photovoltaics. So this is a Moore's law plot. I, I don't have it in exponential form, but it does form an exponential. And it, uh, the annual growth is 30% per year. At 30% per year, we'll be very far short of the goals for mid-century. So instead of 30% per year, it has to be maybe 60% per year. We have to go much faster in increasing this uh, goal. Where is the US? The US is uh, this uh, uh, red color. Not very much activity. Japan is this purple color. They're going pretty big guns. Europe is going pretty large, mostly Germany. They have federal subsidi subsidy for this and makes it uh, cost effective for people to put photoelectrics on their rooftops. So it's going very fast there. And the rest of the world is over here. So this is a, we have some companies in the US, but they're not really com too competitive with the rest of the world yet. Um, <laughs> as I said earlier, 41% uh, has been demonstrated in the laboratory for multi-junctions. And they are on a, um, a time scale schedule that will produce, uh, uh, by 2010, um, devices commercially available at 15 cents, uh, per, uh, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that, by that time, this will be quite competitive with uh, uh, fuels like um, fossil fuels at the rate they're going. So this is not so far out. Uh, what this company does is they have a solar concentrator. And their process is very much like the semiconductor electronics industry. It's uh, a very high tech, um, seemingly uh, complicated process. But they claim that with math, they do millions of these. They can bring it down to this price by 2010. And that's what they're, they're backed by Boeing. So they have some deep pockets working with them on this. OK, outlook for the future. So um, what I think is we need to have, well, I'm, I'm over here with science with a little bit of technology, but we need the rest of the world. And we have to work with industry, get people ex make some acceptance that we're going to make this revolution and um, get some political people to make people do the right thing. Uh, some countries in the world, they're very successful at this. And we have to figure out a way that Americans feel comfortable with um, policy, federal policies. Uh, uh, Germany and Japan are making this transition rather nicely now. But uh, France is also, they have different schemes. But um, we have to figure out what's, what's good for us. And this is my final view graph. Uh, so the first I say is that, that we're going to need a, a mix of renewables um, and new materials. And so this is the part that I know something about, nano things and advanced materials will play a, a large role because we could see in the laboratory many of these problems. Uh, are, have potential, real potential, of being addressed in the next, say, 10 years. Some quicker than others, but they look fairly promising. And uh, so we'll, we'll need people that work between basic 
and applied sciences, so we need different interdisciplinary skills that we have now, so there are real implications for how we train our students. Um, uh, national priorities, uh, we have to make some kind of transition. It has to be, we have to plan that we want to be in this race, or we can be left behind in the dust and buy everything from somebody else. I mean, that's another option. But I don't think people really want to do this. We have to have some jobs left in the US. So I imagine that we have to figure out how we can stay in this game. And so we have to work with industry. And we have to remember that this is a global problem. And um, cooperation with different countries will be essential. Otherwise, we'll have another third world war. Uh, and with the new uh, winners in the energy game on one side and other people trying to beat them. Uh, so international collaboration and networking uh, seem to be interesting. Um, for your information, the United Nations invited me down to give a talk on this because they're interested in this from the political uh, aspect of, of uh, having stability in the world. And they, have, they haven't up till this time been very interested in energy. But they, I gave a talk recently there about was a little bit different than this one, but uh, had a little bit more about YREC conference and why they should be involved and interested. So there's some players, and um, the foreign countries invite me quite a lot to talk about these various issues. I talk in this country too, because you know me. But, uh, uh, but <laughs> at, at the government level, where action is, we're very slow. And sometimes I get a little impatient about it. Oh, we have time for 10 minutes of questions. You had a graph up at the beginning of the talk that showed a cycle over 400,000 years. Slow, yeah, I think, the cycle is about 100,000 years long. Does anybody know what causes a 100,000 years? Well, it, I, think, I think it's a fluctuation, and it, it has something to do with, uh, imagine that you have a huge meteorite or something coming uh, close to the, uh, our planet, and uh, so um, what, it can create a very large dust cloud, and then the sun's rays are uh, limited, so we cool off very quickly. And we've had uh, some of those things. This, this, uh, a meteor somewhere in Yucatan that gives the idea that that sort of thing can happen. That might, might be, there might be something else. I'm not sure, but it, it, it's, it's some um, catastrophe that happens uh, uh, to our planet. You know, we, we have that. But, you know, well, we, in our lifetimes, we've only had small catastrophes. Well, small, you know, when, uh, couple hundred thousand people die. But these catastrophes could be much larger than that. It's possible to have them. Yeah? Yeah. I, if I read the slide correctly, there's a couple of slides before this about Spectre Lab. Yeah, I, I can bring that back. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, in terms of what we did, I would say that we're a very high cost energy state. I pay 11 cents per kilowatt hour for the residential service. The That's still quite a bit lower than this 15 cents. The only way that it's going to pay for me, which is not, we're not a high sunshine state either, is with, uh, you know, large subsidies. Yeah, well, uh, one thing that would help you that we don't have now and the Europeans have is an efficient system of feeding back the energy so that, that you make money from your, your solar outfit. Um, in Massachusetts, it doesn't pay to do this right now. Be it, it's good when you use the energy yourself, but uh, on, on warm days or sunny days and you have more energy than you need, then you can feed it back to the grid and you get money for that. So uh, that reduces the cost. And uh, the Europeans have a good system that you really get paid for your, at, at the going price. And we don't have that because we, we, we that was one of the things that was talked about at YREC, that all the countries have to do this because that encourages people to do the right thing. 
What? Why is it that? It's political, it, and it, it has to do with the um, uh, energy companies that we have now, and, and uh, regulatory processes and the arrangements they make with the states. And, we, and other countries have a federal ruling on these um, decisions. So it happens, uh, you know, with one fell swoop. And here it has to be done 50 different states. And so does that mean this is a FERC issue? What? Is this a FERC issue? Well, in time this is going to, it will happen. You know, if we can't compete, some person will. You, you know, in the U.S., things happen when we have a crisis. We haven't reached the crisis yet. Not enough people know about it. But you've raised the point, so now some people are educated. And so we in the U.S., do you consider five terawatts right now? Uh, well, it's a little bit less than that. Three and a half, maybe. Using that number, how much of that is consumed by us as individuals as opposed to Industry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, the, the figures are like this. Uh, I'll take. I'm going to give you percentages. So you do times uh, 3.5. Okay. So 25 percent approximately goes for transportation. 25 percent goes for residential. These are rough numbers. You know, it's plus or minus a few. Um, a 25 for residential. Is that like your house and 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 things like that? And 25% uh, for industrial use, it's, and then 25% in conversion, one kind of energy to another. So something like thermoelectrics, if you make them more efficient, that's good because we need to make all the conversion methods. We go from one thing, like we, chemical energy to electricity. So that's power plant, right? They take oil and they make electricity. So so Yeah, well, you know, depending on what you do. I mean, it's different, a, l a little bit different. And it, also where you live, because you live in a cold place, you maybe use more fuel than, or you're in a real hot place, you use more air conditioning. But these thermoelectrics, the one big thing that, that happened with that, that, that really blew my mind, is that if you sit on a cool seat, you turn down the air conditioning. So if you're in, in Texas, you know, a hot place, you can save a lot of fuel. So they, in, initially, they put um, a thermoelectrics in, in cars. This is very recently, only for the real expensive ones. But with, with fuels the way, costing what they now, everybody wants it. So that's going to be a good uh, plug for getting new technology. Because once we have some of these change technologies and people really want it, then they want more efficiency for it. So it'll be a little bit more money for research so we can solve the problems because we're close now to making differences in that area. Yes? I wanted to answer the question. Your single mention of geothermal in the case of Iceland really have uh, Oh, we have some in the U.S. too and we have Hawaii. But I'm not about geothermal in a different sense. So geothermal heat pumps that take advantage of the temperature difference air and the ground five feet under the, the surface, where the ground temperature is very constant. So if you don't want heat pumps in it, it makes you... Yeah, well, that, that's Iceland. Summer and heat that, and that's winter. Iceland, yes. No, that's here. Here, here. 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 is a very inexpensive existing technology. Here? Because of the problem. I people in 1915 that did it in Jackson with the bar. Oh, I thought they had to go pretty deep down in the in the U.S. to get no, enough temperature difference. Oh, well, it depends on where you are, I imagine. But okay. Well, uh, uh, what what the people in Iceland say is that uh, their technology can be transported to many places on the planet, and I I don't know exactly which places. I thought that the U.S. didn't have. I I, I stand. Yeah. And it can be retrofitted to any home with an eight inside front lawn. And it and it, it's very it's very common, simple technology that's proved out and it's because of recent increases in energy makes sense. Yet yeah, I've never seen anybody involved with the government ever talk about it. And uh, it 
So, well, so there are commercial applications that are starting to get it in, but, but if, if anything, it seems it would, would, would be something that should receive government attention, something that doesn't involve high tech, it's simple and, and, uh, and, and prove that. So, so, th so this is basically a thermoelectric effect with be no, operating correct. between, between well, the two. Well, no, no, no thermoelectric, you just say heat pump. It's heat pump. It, well, a heat pump is, is, is a. Like recycling it, it operates between a temperature difference. Right, and the maximum efficiency turns out to be around, delta, delta T for around here is around 20 degrees C. It works best. So if you're supplying it to 50 degree uh, Fahrenheit, 20 degrees C above and below is exactly what you want for, uh, okay. for the, this is the whole the capital, the heat air conditioning, the heat exchange the heat. around that heat. Yes, heat exchange pump. Okay. But the electric one, 10% of electric. Are they mass producing these things? Or? Uh, what? The, the thermal electric. Uh, 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 yes, for, for cars. They, the, yes, the, the, a million of those were sold last year. That, that's for a seat? Yeah. Almost. Well, that's only the beginning. You know, you have to fight, start a, a business to make something. And, and once you do this, you can put it on other parts of an automobile or a house or whatever. Now, Florida, FPNL paid for electricity at least, at least as of uh, about five or six years ago. If you had a solar panel and they had to pay you by paper, Well, but I you had to pay them by paper. Well, but not all states, most of the states don't have um, a good exchange. Right. That's what I'm saying. And it has to be made more uniform in the country. Okay, one more question. I'll do two, two. Uh, these two. What about the Bonet cells made out of another day? Um, they wear out and have to dispose of. You know, what, what is that? I mean, if everyone starts using them, what effect is that going to have on, on Okay, um, um, most of the photovoltaics that are used today are just silicon. Silicon is like sand. So it's not uh, too environmentally um, uh, a, a problem. And they're thin film. I mean, what people are moving to now is thin film films, uh, uh, silicon. That's about 15% efficient. Nothing like the best ones, but uh, there are quite a few companies that that are selling this. Totally different technology uh, that's moving uh, fast. It's a lot cheaper, uh, um, but it's not commercial yet. Uh, is um, organic semiconductors. And there you can roll out large amounts, uh, but the efficiencies are now approaching about 6%. They're getting close to being interesting for commercial, and they will compete. It's good to have some competing technologies, because it makes everything compete, and they all get better. Final question. Uh, two questions. Just one comment, one question. Uh, the geothermal energy, we have in the States, the man in the States. The problem is in California. The problem is in Iceland, the water that goes into geothermal is recent. Well, well, how about Hawaii? Hawaii is a different matter. That's new. Yeah, that's new. new. That would be more, much more like Iceland. Yes, exactly. That's what's fine. The second thing is, isn't energy storage? The oh, yes, yes, I didn't get into that. Uh, we really, uh, um, the whole world has to develop better uh, storage units. And, uh, you know, we, we have some, there are progress that has been made in the past few years, but we, that has big, big time improvements needed. I wish I had more time to go into more of these, but all we can do now. <laughs>